This is the goofy movie mockumentary that I never knew I needed. Is this real? It feels real. Nah. He's chunking up the deuce in the Disney conference room. This isn't real. I wanted it to be though. Welcome back to my channel. It's Tyra here with another struggle review here to discuss Atlanta season four, episode eight, the goof who sat at the door. Now, before we get into all things, just how brilliant this episode was, I need you guys to drop down and subscribe to my channel and like this video. I'm going to give you guys a moment to do that. And then we're going to come back and discuss. I was not at all expecting this. I see exactly why they decided not to give us a trailer for episode eight. Just to let all of this sink in, all of this brilliant creativity. This was so dope. Go back, 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 back. hopefully subscribe to see more of me let's get into this episode now first of all i thought something went astray i thought i accidentally switched the channel this is not atlanta what is happening why am i getting an intro why am i getting a band logo and why is a voiceover happening but once i looked at the disclaimer and saw that band stood for black american networks i fell out and i realized that we were in the right place yes ban all of that upn ban all of that wb ban all of that we will need that fox when it was black fox ban all of that the subtle genius things in this show is always amazing even though we didn't get a trailer for episode eight i kind of knew where we were going with the show being titled the goof that sat by the door which is a play on the 1969 novel, The Spook Who Sat By The Door by Sam Greenlee. Now, I did not read the book, but I did see the 1973 film adaptation many, many years ago, definitely worth revisiting. But for those who don't know, the book is about the first black CIA agent placed there only to gain the black vote from a senator who wants to target the CIA for discrimination. He knows and he accepts that he is strictly there to be a token. Look, we do accept black people. We have one black CIA agent. He later leaves and he uses all the tools that he learned, like guerrilla warfare, to teach, uplift, and recruit a whole lot of young black youth, as well as different gangs, to form his very own resistance. Distance. We were going to use that and place Goofy there? This has to be interesting. Now when I tell you that this mockumentary felt so real that I paused before I could see that it wasn't to go and search up these people, especially Thomas Washington that we are following here. The whole interview situation, the coalition with the Watts riots and Disney, him growing up like this episode had so much depth and was so freaking layered that I really didn't know where to start. We meet his friends, family, old co-workers. We get into his childhood, his obsession with cartoons, sketching, and the tough neighborhood that he grew up in, just simply being tormented for who he was and what he wanted to do. As a Black person, we are constantly being told what we don't do. Black people don't talk like that. Black people don't dress like that. Black people don't read. Black people can't swim. Black people don't consume certain genres of music and movies. Black people don't do all of these things. Black people definitely do not have ambitions to be an animator. It's considered weird to have aspirations outside of what's considered the norm for black people. When sadly, these things are all normal, but depending on your neighborhood, your upbringing, you aren't afforded that. And sadly, you might become a target. I really like that they incorporated the LA riots, the Rodney King beatings, to show that even from a young age when he was being targeted, for being different and wanting to be an animator, going to college, just being completely obsessed and engrossed in Disney, 
we have different forms of someone or something throughout his life telling him what he's not allowed to be strictly because he's black so even from that young age to when he finally gets the ceo position we have already created all of this tension underneath all of this resentment Tom is feeling like he has something to prove, not only as an animator, but as a black man. When sadly, Thomas is clearly ambitious, he's motivated, he's talented, he's creative, all of these things that led him up and pushed him to where he could even be in the spaces of a Disney, where he loves and looks up to all his life, the character of Goofy. Now, when we have different people speak on Thomas's obsession with Goofy, how he loved the character, and we hear the actual animator illustrator describe Goofy, he's written to not be really aware of how slow he is. He's really gullible. Though he's a good Samaritan, he is half-witted. <laughs> he's a colored boy, and he avoids the overexertion of himself, always tries to take the easy way out. Oh, the black funny, lazy nigga. Oh, that's where we going with Goofy. Oh. Now I do love that even though Thomas clearly wants to be an animator, he loves the art form, he loves everything about it, including Disney, most of all Goofy, already early on before he is accepted by Disney, you know, for their diversity program, getting more into that, the spook who sat by the door, waiting until pretty much the 80s and 90s to go, you know what, we could use a little diversity around here. Let's bring in some black people. <laughs> we already have that going on with him being accepted into that, but we also have him have a flair to be extra and be real black with his animation early on when we have, you know, the animation of Goofy Please, is very much giving nigga please or even when we have the short film animation that got him into school at all the uh little prince it's not you know the typical white little prince it's actually prince the artist formerly known as prince minneapolis prince like i'm ready to black and shit up it was always there especially with him idolizing and viewing Goofy as a black man. So in my eyes, you are displaying a black man in this way, even though it was strictly just animation, everything matters. Especially with the spectacle, discriminatory, racist animation that Disney and other animated companies were known for early on. If you always go back and look at the imagery of how black people were used as far as animation, live action, cinematic portrayals overall, child, it is so tired. <laughs> it is absolutely so tired. And we do see that Thomas did not separate the two. Goofy is a black man, a lazy, dim-witted black man who is the butt of every single joke. This is my opportunity to change that. Now, when we have Thomas mistakenly placed on a ballot and voted for due to a mix-up in the name and becoming the CEO of Disney by default, that shit was hilarious, but it was played so realistic in the way that the mockumentary was going that I was like, it's, I kept questioning myself as to was there any real, I was searching up names. I was like, where is this man? How dare y'all sweep this brother under the rug? I was looking for all kind of shit that just was not there. But when we have that happen, and he decides to make that an opportunity because you have to remember he got in on, you know, oh, this is a diversity program for Disney. Remembering that Thomas, as well as another black animator that he brought along with him, they were in midway, you know, more so low level. And he decided, first of all, y'all not gonna knock me out of this position. <laughs> y'all voted, it's done. I'm the freaking CEO, deuces on the table, like hitting poses, like, yeah, nigga. Like, <laughs> I was falling out, but I was intrigued at the same time. When the people in the doc talk and say he had an initial meeting that said, why are we as animators allowing Mickey to be a racist? And they're like, what the hell are you talking about? These are strictly cartoons. No, Mickey Mouse is white. I don't care what y'all say, he's white. Goofy is a dog, but he's black as well as Pluto. Why would Goofy allow Mickey to drag one of his own around on a leash? Like, not only am I about to change everything here while I'm here, because I do understand that I'm here for a good time and at a long time, as soon as y'all have an opportunity to bump my ass out of the way, you are going to do that. So before you have an opportunity to do that, not only am I gonna bring up these low level animators, change things around here, I am planning to make the deepest, blackest, segregation, <laughs> police violence, 
gang mentality, single parenthood, Disney movie ever. What movie is that? A goofy movie. Now tying a goofy movie into this entire episode definitely made me want to go back and revisit the movie and definitely gives all of this validation as to why we as black folks <laughs> love a goofy movie so much. Not that it's probably you know not loved by many but we literally go up for a goofy movie depending on you know which generation you are in. It's for the culture. We get that great father and son bonding between Matt and Goofy, the power line performance, the animation was so great, all of the characters had swag, Roxanne was fine, <laughs> you know Max wasn't popular, he was bothered by that, you know the, the lack of sauce, you know we need a little money around here. There is so much you can relate to in a good Goofy movie and there is so much you know low level subtext. So it's not really hard to tie in a Goofy movie to the exaggerated things going on here in this episode. Not only that, but having Thomas here portrayed in a way that this is a personal film for him. Not only, you know, as a representation for blackness or black men. I love when we speak on, oh, you know, at the time there was, you know, kind of this queer thing happening with the way that black men were portrayed in the media. This faux queer comedy, you know, two snaps in a circle. All we had, you know, the hyper gangster masculine portrayal, but nothing in between that. I wanted to display something that I no, I had a really good connection with my father before he passed away. And in the future and now I have a good connection with my son. We have, you know, the correlation with the fishing trips. Like there was so much nuance and all these correlations happening for shit here to be just absolutely false. That was so incredible and mind blowing and so smart. And I just was watching this shit with my mouth wide open. Like, wow, Atlanta, y'all doing the most. <laughs> to even tie things in here with something like a goofy movie that are all just historically black oh this was supposed to represent oh you know the Jim Crow South we were gonna put that in there we we're gonna talk about you know the freedom ride and this was supposed to display the green look and this was supposed to talk about you know black exceptionalism and expectations and like what like and just how smartly it was written and how it was portrayed it's believable and even though you've seen the goofy movie a million times you're like well you mean, yeah I could be oh <laughs> crazy i did love that this mockumentary gave me several emotions sometimes i was high being all you know highly investigator and then sometimes we get comedy like with brian mcknight like you know how do you feel about the way that this score and the soundtrack well you know hey it's you know saying white poppy like who are you listening to tevin campbell oh yeah from that point on powerline was gonna be tevin campbell like and you're tying that shit together even though it is just so fake or when we have him going, oh, you know, black people don't move like that. Black people don't dance like that. This is not what a dab looks like. This is like, <laughs> I think uh, as far as animation, we have gone above and beyond to be like, like, what, what is this? Like, who drew this? Like, there always seems to be, you know, a bit of, you know, a couple of shortcomings when it comes to animating black characters properly or giving them, you know, real black characteristics or the writing room not being actually filled with any black people. So they don't know how this black character would speak. Like Gerald from Hey Arnold to me was everything. Like I love Gerald. I love what he had to say. I love his animation. I love his little swag in the show. We don't always get a Gerald or, you know, hey, I drew the dab so many times that I was exhausted. I went up to the office, you know, Janet was there, Brian was there, Sinbad was there, Eddie Murphy was there. And he said, hey, who ordered the white rice? Like, <laughs> it was, you know, so realistic. But even though I was enjoying it, I did realize that this was more than just, you know, about Walt Disney or, you know, animation. This could be totally used as a metaphor overall, just for somebody like Thomas. Here we have this black man who wants to do so much with this goofy movie, wants it to be a representation for himself and so many others. Like he is taking this movie to heart. It is so serious for him. But on the other hand, we have him have this chip on his shoulder, internalize everything. Feels like he has the need to prove himself. 
I'm still down for my people regardless of the CEO position, regardless of his power, regardless of any wealth. I am still black, I'm still down, literally carrying the weight of blackness on his shoulders just because he is still not only internalizing being tormented as a kid but wanting to be an animator, being told, you know, you're less than or you're weird, being picked on, but just to prove himself. And I felt like that was to speak on a lot of black men who may be in the position of somebody like Thomas. It's always a need to go. I have to think before I do or say anything. As a black man or a black woman in any high position of power, I feel like there's a need to do it for the culture. He is putting pressure on himself to try to incorporate everything possible <laughs> as far as blackness and correlated with the relationship between Max and Goofy, all while still trying to make a statement. And then there's also this pressure of, I have to do it all now because I'm not gonna get another opportunity. This is all that I, or you know, many of us as black people ever get. I have to put it all in here. Who's to say I'm gonna be, or anybody's gonna be in the position to where I can fund, <laughs> say what I want, and depict this cartoon or you know this black goofy the way that I really want to. And then there's also that dynamic of power. He begins to freaking lose it, not only under this pressure and this weight of, you know, oh, this isn't just for me, this is for everybody. Goofy is gonna be for everybody. This is a representation of black, you know, fatherhood, black man, just so much. It is to be good. We all also have him lose his freaking mind. Once again, with the metaphors that can be used elsewhere, you know, a lot of black people are not in this high of a position. Now that I'm in it and I can regulate certain shit, I'm being very, very much so extra about it. And why shouldn't I be? We don't get this opportunity often, but we also have him begin to be unfaithful. He's cheating, he's lashing out, not only at his wife, at which you know she leaves him, but his, uh, his behavior is starting to change towards his son when it was never that before. But now that he is in this position and he he is absolutely internalizing Goofy to the point that he starts to fucking act like Goofy. It has changed him for the worse. We speak on mental illness and nobody really noticing it or really knowing what to call it. We do have his wife and son talk about, you know, him losing it, beginning to talk with himself. Like he's just so obsessed with this that he is losing himself. With all of that going on, he still manages to, you know, flex all this power, turn down the money. Like, no, I'm not stepping down. I'm not dropping the project. This is what I want to do because it means something. But in the meantime, we are being braggadocious. We are telling everybody about it. And we also have different black people on the outside, whether it's, you know, gangs or somebody as big as, you know, the nation, we need to be represented here. Are you gonna put this in here? Can you like, oh yes, he's made all of these promises as to what's gonna be in this film. And he has put all of this pressure on himself for it to not even happen. It was just metaphor on top of metaphor and different scenarios that can be placed to, you know, different names and faces. When he tells a friend like, I'm packing around this gun, I'm surrounding myself with, you know, different security, gangs, these people, these, I feel like I didn't take that money and somebody is after me, they are out to get me. Like, sir, sir, y'all doing too much. <laughs> y'all are absolutely doing too much. They just pulled from, from a little bit of everywhere and then on top of that sprinkled on the Goofy movie like it was it was crazy just how believable this was and how much truth was in this and them you know snapping us back into reality with uh evidence on the crime scene being a goofy shoe and a goofy glove child like <laughs> Once he started to, you know, gain power, he started to internalize Goofy so much, even though he was the furthest thing from what Goofy represented. As far as old Disney animation, you know, the half-witted, oh, he's lazy, he's this. No, now, Goofy, the a Goofy movie Goofy, you know, the father, <laughs> that strong bun, the fishing trip, that was all him. And even all of the other things that he wanted to be represented in the film, you know, the replacement of Bigfoot when they were supposed to be going to find Huey Newton's throne. <laughs> Him, you know, wanting Goofy to be stopped and popped off by a cop, like all kind of things. Like, this is me, this is what I want my movie to be. Yes, I'm obsessed, yes, I have lost my mind, but the project is complete. Even though I am fired at this point, at least they are allowing me to see the finished product and I accomplish what I set out to do, even though I've pretty much lost everything in the process. When he saw the final cut of the movie and realized like, wow, y'all changed absolutely everything. You mean to tell me what I want for myself as a man, as a person, blackness, 
it's you know about as real as bigfoot this this means absolutely nothing once again somebody confirming that what i want how i want us portrayed things i want to talk about like the fact that this is a goofy disney movie is crazy you're telling me that those things don't matter you know what i'm just gonna get out of here and pretty much go and end it all I even love the reaction that we got from everybody when they just bring up the accident. I knew eventually it was coming because when we get into the mockumentary, we hear from everybody except for him. So I pretty much knew that he was gone. But in the end, to have them tie that all together with his wife speaking on, you know, finally actually watching the movie and correlating the two, you know, not only his death, you know, that's if he's actually dead, child, because he might have pulled a whole, whole Tupac and ran off because they did not find a body. <laughs> but her just collating the two and going you know I'm proud of you know what he did and just kind of goofy in that movie the fishing trip him hanging over Max having to save him being a representation for him as a man and how he maybe went out that was incredible everything here was incredible and it was absolutely mind-blowing and I'm just gonna miss Atlanta. <laughs> I am gonna miss Atlanta. Atlanta said we are going out with a bang. We are speaking on all facets of everything. You thought it was just gonna be Tyler Perry and them? No, we are coming for you to Walt Disney, all while giving all of these undertones and metaphors for, you know, black men or, you know, just creatives in Hollywood in general. Like, it was so layered and so good. Hit the like button. Well, you guys, that was my review for Atlanta season four, episode eight, The Goof Who Sat By The Door. I hope you enjoyed it. Please drop down and tell me what you thought about this review. I really had to have a couple of my ducks in a row for this, which is why you guys are getting it later than usual. I would normally try to drop on a Friday, but this here, as well as, you know, a schedule conflict made me drop it later, but I did not mind that because I had time to kind of piece together what I wanted to say here and how I wanted to say it, child. Atlanta will take you there but i look forward to reading you guys comments please like this video share this video run it up if you care i see you guys next time bye